Welcome to the Brian Voice. I'm Randy Seaver. Today we're going to be looking at John chapter 15. Uh, I want us to particularly focus on verse 16 of that chapter, but uh, rather than simply looking at that verse, I'd like to consider uh, the context of that verse. In uh, verse 16 of John 15, we read, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and that whatsoever you ask my fa the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Um, now, it has been argued by the provisionist and others that um, the ones to whom our Lord is speaking in this passage, as well as the ones to whom our Lord is referring in John chapter 17 and other places, uh, are simply the apostles that our Lord Jesus has chosen. So that he's not talking about choosing people for salvation, but that he is choosing people for the apostleship. Now, it's clear, is it not, that these <clears throat> disciples had been chosen for the apostleship. There's no question that uh, 11 of them, to whom he is speaking here, uh, had been chosen. Indeed, he had also chosen Judas, and um, we read this back in chapter 6, and yet Judas was a devil from the beginning. But to what were they chosen? And the answer is they were not chosen for eternal salvation, in, according to these texts, but they were chosen for the apostolate. Um, not only that, but um, these disciples of our Lord Jesus had been chosen as part of the um, theocratic kingdom. They were members of the covenant nation of Israel. But there is another sense in which they were chosen, and that is they were chosen uh, to be holy. That is, they were chosen to be saved. Quite often we hear people say, well, see there, uh, people are not chosen to be saved. They're chosen to bring forth fruit, or they're chosen to be holy, or they're chosen to be sanctified, and so forth. And our response to that is, what do you think salvation is about? Uh, we have so emphasized the, the idea of justification that we forget that justification is only the beginning of the process through which God brings us into conformity with his Son. What God desires is that we come into a loving, um, fellowshipping relationship with him so that we have communion with him, um, and he does so by uh, uniting us to the Lord Jesus. Uh, this is very clear from the from the scriptures. And so, yes, we are chosen to be holy. We're chosen to bring forth fruit. But this is what salvation is all about. We've, we've, we've emphasized justification, but mem remember that the, the, the purpose of God in saving people is to bring us into a loving uh, relationship and fellowship with him so that we will glorify him by the way in which we reflect his glory. Um, now, if we are to draw near to God, the question is, are we to draw near to God if we feel, or will we draw near to God if we feel guilty? Or will we, like our first parents, flee from the presence of God because we recognize that we are naked? Before we ever come into God's presence so that we might be sanctified, we must first of all understand that we have been justified freely by the grace of God so that we can come into his presence with a conscience that has been cleared and we are able to worship him freely and without fear. Uh, this is what we read in a number of passages, that we may serve him without fear. Okay, so justification is necessary for that to occur, but justification is not the end. In other words, we are not simply forgiven so that we can go to heaven when we die, and that's the end of the salvation process. No, salvation is ultimately intended to make us fruit bearers. Now, uh, what I'd like to do is look in uh, John, John's Gospel to see how Jesus and John both use the word true and truth. Uh, because in this passage, our Lord Jesus, in verse 1, has said this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser, or my Father is the farmer. He is an expert fruit producer, and he is going to produce fruit in everyone who is united to Christ. This is what is very clearly set forth in the text. But what does Jesus mean when he says, 
I am the true vine. Well, let's see how John and Jesus both use this word true and truth in the Gospel of John. First of all, you'll recall that back in chapter 1 in the um, preface to this particular Gospel, our Lord Jesus is described as the true light. We're told that John the Baptist came to bear witness of the light. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. And then John says, that was the true light that coming into the world lights every man. What does he mean when he says he was the true light? Does that mean that the lights that uh, we see in the Old Testament, such as the lights that came from the menorah that stood in the tabernacle and temple complex, or perhaps the light that came from the pillar of cloud that led the people of Israel through the wilderness during their journey, um, is he saying that those were not real lights? And the answer is, of course not. They were real lights. But they were not the true light. What John is saying here is that Jesus is the typical fulfillment of what we find in the Old Testament scriptures. He was the true light. In verses 14 and 17 of John chapter 1, we read that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Uh, first of all, we read, the Word, that is the eternal Lagos, the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the Father, full, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's altogether likely that John was thinking back to the uh, time when Moses requested to see the glory of Yahweh, and Yahweh said, <clears throat> you're not going to be able to see my full glory. You can't see the fullness of my glory and live, but I'm going to pass beside you. Uh, you were going to see something of my afterglow, the afterglow of my glory, and I'm going to declare my attributes before you. Because when we talk about the glory of God, we are talking about the sum of his glorious attributes. And so when Yahweh passes by, uh, he hides Moses uh, in the cleft of the rock and he declares his glorious attributes. And one of the things he says is that he is full of goodness and truth. Full of goodness and truth. Perhaps John and, both, and Jesus as well were thinking in terms of this experience in which now we are told that Jesus is the one who is full of grace and and truth. He has already uh, signaled to us that he's uh, pointing us back to this tabernacle period because he talks about the fact that our Lord Jesus has pitched his tent among us. We beheld his glory, the glory of, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, he is the one who has tabernacled or pitched his tent among us. In verse 17 as well we read, for the law came by Moses but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, does that mean that truth did not come by Moses? Uh, does that mean that what we read in the first five books of the Bible are not to be regarded as divine truth that has in been inspired by God? And, of course, the answer is no. Well, he's not saying that no truth came by Moses, but what he's saying is what we find in our Lord Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of what we read in the Old Testament Scriptures. Uh, he is the fulfillment of what Moses wrote. Later in chapter 5, as you recall, um, our Lord Jesus said, if you believe Moses, you'd love me because he wrote about me. I am the fulfillment of what Moses wrote. In other words, grace and truth, that is, grace and fulfillment, came by Jesus Christ. <clears throat> We see much the same thing in John chapter 4 and verse 24. Our Lord Jesus has been dealing with this woman at the well of Sychar. Uh, she is a woman who uh, has had five husbands. She is living now with a man who is not her husband. And she comes to the well to draw water in the middle of the day, perhaps because she did not want to have to meet the other women of the city who came out early in the morning or late in the evening to draw water, but she comes alone, and Jesus is there resting while he's waiting on his disciples. And um, 
So he engages her in conversation. And ultimately she says to him, after he says to her, go call your husband, um, he is putting his finger on her characteristic sin. And, and so she seems to want to change the subject. And she, so, so she says to him, let me ask you a theological question. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, but you Jews say we ought to worship in Jerusalem. Uh, where, where should we worship? And the Lord Jesus said, woman, I'll tell you the truth. The hour is coming and now is. That's an important phrase. The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship God neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, some have taken this verse to mean that we must worship God in accordance with God's re truth revealed in the scriptures. And that certainly is true. But I think our Lord Jesus is saying more than that. I think he's saying we ought to, uh, we, we must worship God in spirit and in the reality of the situation, not in terms of the types and shadows of the old covenant. In other words, the time of fulfillment has come. The hour is coming and now is, our Lord Jesus says. We are living in the time of fulfillment. Now, does that mean that everything that is going to be fulfilled is being fulfilled or has been fulfilled? Of course not. No, there are still things that must be fulfilled. But we are living in the age of fulfillment, and the time of fulfillment has begun. Again, Additionally, in uh, chapter 6 of John's Gospel, verse 32, um, our Lord Jesus, having fed the multitude with the two the loaves and fish that uh, belonged to the little lad, um, there were many that followed him um, across the lake, and he is discoursing uh, with them, and um, they said to him, "Look, our fathers, God, God gave our fathers bread to eat in the wilderness." He has said to them. Don't, don't labor for the bread that perishes, but labor for the bread that endures to everlasting life. In other words, don't focus on the types and the shadows. Focus on the fulfillment. And they, they said to him, our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. God gave them bread to eat. And uh, Jesus said, don't labor for the bread that perishes, but labor for the bread that endures, endures to everlasting life. And then he says, I am the true bread. Now, does that mean the bread that God gave to Israel in the wilderness, in the, in the desert, was not real bread? And the answer is, of course not. But what our Lord Jesus is saying is, that bread was a typical foreshadowing of me. I am the true bread. I am the fulfillment of that. Now, in the light of all of that, when we come to chapter 15 of John's Gospel, and our Lord Jesus says, I am the true vine, who is the typical vine about whom he is speaking? In other words, he's, he's not merely saying, I am... Uh, the real vine, uh, the spiritual vine, that's certainly true, but what he's doing is he's com contrasting himself with something in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament scriptures. And so the question is, if Jesus is the true vine, who is the typical vine? Who foreshadowed him, both negatively and positively? And I think the answer is very clear. If you go back to the Old Testament, uh, I'll just mention a couple of passages. One is in, uh, uh, in um, Isaiah chapter 5. The other is in Psalm 80. And in both those passages, Israel is referred to as the vine. God brought a vine out of Egypt and planted it, and it flourished. Uh, in the Isaiah passage, uh, he establishes a vineyard, he takes the stones and he throws them out of the vineyard, prepares the place for the vine to be planted, and he plants it, and then he builds 
a wine press in the vineyard. Now, the question is, why did he build a wine press in the vineyard? And I think the answer ought to be fairly obvious. He built a wine press in the vineyard because he was expecting to harvest good grapes. He was expecting fruit, and he had every right to expect fruit. And ultimately, he says, what more could I have done to my vineyard than what I have done to my vineyard? Here's the problem. The problem is that even though Israel was this vine, Israel never did, in most cases at any rate, bring forth fruit to the glory of God. Uh, when Yahweh says, when I looked that it should bring forth good grapes, it brought forth sour grapes. He's talking about the, the history of Israel. Um, later he says, my people are like a backsliding heifer. In other words, uh, they're like a heifer that is brought to the yoke and then backs away from the yoke because it doesn't want to wear the yoke. What is the yoke? Well, the yoke in view here, I think, is talking about the covenant that God made with Israel. And God promised Israel that if they would keep covenant with him, if they would obey his covenant, then certain things would be true of them. If they didn't obey his covenant, then those things would not be true of them. I'd like for you to go back with me to um, Exodus chapter 19, because there, on the eve of the giving of the um, covenant, the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel, this is what Yahweh said to the people of, people of Israel. Um, verse 4, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how that I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you indeed will obey my voice and keep my covenant, obey my covenant, then you shall be, number one, a special treasure to me above all the people of the earth, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And so he says three things they're going to be if they keep his covenant. In other words, if they are proper fruit bearers, that is, if, if they are obedient to his covenant. What are they? Well, number one, you shall be a special treasure. Number two, you shall be a kingdom of priests. And number three, you shall be a holy nation. Now, I want you to keep that in your mind because we're going to go to another passage in, in 1 Peter and I want you to consider what Peter says there a little bit later. But I want you to keep all of this in mind. Here, here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I am the true vine. Why is it necessary for the true vine to come? And, and the answer is because the typical vine did not bring forth proper fruit to the glory of God. And in contrast to that, what Jesus is saying is, I am the true vine, I am bringing forth fruit, but not only am I bringing forth fruit, but everyone who is united to me is also bringing forth fruit. And that's what we see in John chapter 15. Now, is he talking here only about the apostles? Uh, are we talking here only about the twelve? In this case, the eleven, because Jesus has now departed. But it, are we talking here only about those uh, those men that were seated on one side of the table in the por portrait of the Last uh, Supper, or are we talking about other disciples? And I think there's, there's no reason to believe that this is limited to the 11 disciples who are still with our Lord. I think he's talking about everyone who is already united to Christ by faith and everyone who will be united to Christ by faith. And the characteristic of those people is that we are going to bring forth fruit to the glory of God. And so, um, let's just talk about a couple of other passages before we look at uh, John chapter uh, 15 again. In, in Matthew chapter 21, you'll recall the parable of the uh, vine dressers or the husbandmen in the vineyard. 
and what our Lord Jesus has to say to them as he begins to speak to them in judgment. And we find this um, discourse about judgment coming upon Israel uh, continuing until chapter 20, the end of chapter 24. Ultimately, in chapter 23, our Lord Jesus says to the leaders of Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stone the prophets and kill those who were sent unto you, how often would I have gathered your children unto me? Uh, but you would not. He's not talking here about the people of Israel per se, but he's talking here in judgment to the uh, leaders of Israel. And he's saying, I would have jo jo uh, jo uh, gathered these children to myself, but you would not. You are guilty of withholding truth and lying and so forth. And so in a, an enacted parable, our Lord Jesus, uh, along with his disciples, then walks out of the temple complex and pronounces judgment on the people of Israel. But this begins back in chapter 21, where we read the parable of these vine dressers. And listen to what our Lord Jesus says to them. This is in chapter 1 of Matthew's Gospel. Um, and I want you to pay particular attention to what our Lord is expecting from these vine dressers or from the vineyard over which they took, they had care. Here another parable. This is verse 33. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard. Who is that? Well, it's Yahweh. And he planted a vineyard and he set a hedge about it. Sounds like uh, Isaiah 5 and Psalm 80, doesn't it? And he dug a wine press in it, and he built a tower against. Why did he build the wine press? And the answer is because he was expecting fruit. What fruit was he expecting? And the answer is he was expecting the fruit of obedience to his covenant, to his law. And he leased it to vine dressers and went to a far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants in, uh, to the vine dressers that they might receive what is he looking for? That they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. And he sent another servant, more than the first. And they did likewise to them. We see the history of the Old Testament. God sending his prophets over and over and over again to call his people to obedience to his covenant. And so they kill them. And then last of all, verse 37, he sent them his son, saying, Surely they will respect my son. But the vine dressers saw the son, and they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. And so they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. And therefore, when the owner of that vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? And they said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him, listen to it again, the fruits in their seasons. And Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you, that is Israel, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits of it. Who is that nation? It is Christ and all those who are united to him by faith. This is what we see in chapter 15 of John's Gospel. And then he says, and whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomsoever it falls, it will grind him to power, powder. And then, now when the chief priest and the Pharisees heard this parable, what a perceptive bunch they were, they perceived that he was speaking about them. Let me share another verse with you. And this verse is found in 1 Peter, 
Peter's first epistle and chapter 2. If you have a Bible there with you, please turn to it. 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up to a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is written in the scriptures, keep in mind this is the very verse that our Lord Jesus quotes back in Matthew 21, um, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to you who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. But you... Now, listen to this in the light of what we read back in Exodus 19. This is what you are going to be if you keep my covenant, Yahweh says to the people of Israel in, in uh, chapter 19 of Exodus. You shall be what? What are you going to be if you obey my voice, if you keep my covenant? You shall be a chosen nation, a holy nation. You shall be a special people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Obviously a reference back to Hosea, in which uh, we see these, these um, offspring of this uh, prostitute that Hosea is told to uh, marry, and you have a, a, a son that is called Lo, Lo Ami, not my people, and you have another called Lo Ruachmai, not mercied. But later, in the place that they are called not my people and not mercy, they are going to be called the people of God. This is what the, re the, the passage is referring to. Who were not my people, not the people of God, you who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. What's he saying here? Well, it seems to me what he's saying very clearly is that we have now become what Israel would have become had they kept covenant with God. Had they been obedient to the law that God gave to them, then this is what would have been true of them. But because they broke the covenant, the kingdom has been taken from them and given to another nation, bringing forth the fruits of it. Who is that nation? Well, the answer is that nation is uh, comprised of those who have been united, united to Christ by faith. Jesus says, I am the true vine. And then he goes on to say, every branch in me that does not bring, bring forth fruit, the Father purges it or, or, or perhaps prunes it or perhaps cleanses it so that it might bring forth more fruit. What's God concerned with? And the answer is he's concerned with our bringing forth fruit. That, and that fruit is obedience to his revealed will. This is what God is concerned with. And so he's talking here about the fulfillment of the old covenant. We are now living in the time of fulfillment and we are, in the place of Israel now, a nation that brings forth the fruits that God is looking for. So, Jesus says, I'm the true vine, and you are united to me. Who's he talking about? Well, he's not talking just about the twelve disciples, or the twelve apostles, or the eleven apostles now that, Jesus, that Judas has gone out. Uh, but he's talking about every believer. 
that will ever be united to him. He's not talking just about a, a certain number of believers, but he's talking about all those who are united to him and who are, as evidence of that, bringing forth fruit to the glory of God. And this is why we read in chapter 15 and verse 16, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask in my Father's name, he will give it to you. Again, this fruit isn't talking about soul winning. This fruit is talking about obedience to the will of God as revealed in scriptures. And he's talking not merely about 12, uh, 11 disciples, but he's talking here <clears throat> about everyone who is united to Christ by faith. And he says to all of us, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Again, you say, well, this isn't talking about salvation. This is talking about holiness. Well, guess what? That's what salvation is all about. He's chosen us to be holy and without blame before him. Well, I hope this has been clear to you. If not, leave a comment in the comment section, and we'll try to do better next time. Um, either that or I'll try to uh, answer your comment in the comment section. If you haven't yet uh, subscribed to the channel, let me encourage you to do that. If you like the video, click like. Please share the video with your friends and encourage them to come and um, listen to what we're having to say here. Again, I hope it's been helpful. Until next time, may God richly bless you.